Well, we're going to explore, the, we're exploring the epistles of John and we're entering the first epistle of John. We did it backwards in the minds of many. We took the third and second epistles first, partly because they, se they set the stage for what we call 1 John. 1 John is actually a sermon and sent to many churches. But the, the background that emerged from our previous studies I think is useful. So we did an inverse order, 3, 2, 1. But we're now entering a five-week study of 1 John. And uh, the early church in the first century was under attack from both the inside and the outside. So what's changed for us, right? It should not surprise us that the Holy Spirit has anticipated every conceivable form of attack in the Scripture. And uh, every form of attack and diversion. And these three epistles are full of insights that are timely for each of us today. At the personal level, as well as the corporate level. And uh, this is going to climax here in what's called First John. And uh, who is John? Well, he's the brother of James the Greater. And uh, he was probably the younger of the sons of Zebedee and Salome. And he was born in Bethsaida. And his father was apparently a man of some wealth because he had a, quite a business there. He doubtless uh, trained uh, uh, in all that constituted the normal education of a Jewish youth. When he grew up, he followed the occupation of a fisherman with his family on the Sea of Galilee. So don't assume that a fisherman was some kind of illiterate, blue-collar type character. Uh, many of them were probably, but uh, J uh, John was, had the benefit of an uh, 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 education of a Jewish youth. And uh, when John the Baptist, different John now, when John the Baptist began his ministry in the wilderness of Judea, John with many of the others gathered around him and was deeply influenced by John the Baptist's teaching. And there he heard the announcement. John the Baptist twice he introduced Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. You know, that's a very Jewish title that he uses. And on the invitation of Jesus, John the Apostle, that would be the Apostle, became a disciple of John the Baptist. And, and well, he, he was, but now he's a John. He became a disciple of Jesus, and he ranked among his followers for a time. He and his brother then returned to their former avocation, but it's not uh, uh, it's not certain for how long. And so uh, Jesus again called them, and now they left all and permanently joined the company of his disciples. There's sort of two callings here: one just to be a believer, but then being called to actually follow Christ full time is the second step here that's in, in view. And for their zeal and intensity of character, Jesus named both he and his brother with a nickname, Boanerges, which is Sons of Thunder. I'm always amused by that because I remember as a kid in Sunday school with pictures and stuff, you always see John somehow uh, portrayed in sort of feminine terms. And uh, that's not scriptural. These guys were, these are rough and ready guys. The Sons of Thunder was our Lord's own nickname for them. And this spirit of what the Jews would call chutzpah broke out on a number of occasions as you read the Gospels. You'll find that these guys are, are pretty gutsy guys. And so, now John attains insider status. He became one of the innermost circle. He was present at the raising of Jairus' daughter in Mark 5. He was present at the transfiguration in Matthew 17. He was in the inner group at Gethsemane in, Ma in Matthew 26. And of course, he was one of four. They had the three plus Andrew were, were treated an inside briefing on the uh, Mount of Olives at night, which becomes the Olivet Discourse, as recorded in Matthew 24, and it's also recorded in Mark 13. So we'll be encountering that in, 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 uh, the before the end of Mark. And he was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. That was a term that the gospel uses of John that's his way of not using his own, his name in a sense. Now that final week of John's gospel, uh, at the, and, and it constitutes a major portion of John's gospel, by the way, that last week of Christ's ministry. At the betrayal, he and Peter followed Christ afar off while the others fled hastily. And at the trial, he followed Christ into the council chamber, which means he had some kind of political leverage there to even have access there. And he went from thence to the praetorium and then to the place of crucifixion. That, that, that implied he had, he had some kind of leverage here. And Mary, of course, was consigned to John's care at the cross. And, of course, we uh, de dealt with that heavily when we went to John 2 for a number of reasons. We explored that in depth in our previous session. And to both uh, John and Peter, Mary first conveyed tidings of the resurrection. That's Mary Magdalene, that is. And they were the first to go and see wh what her strange words meant. 
And uh, that's where he found out that John could outrun uh, Peter, right? So after, after the resurrection, he and Peter again returned to the Sea of Galilee where the Lord revealed himself to them. And we find Peter and John frequently together. They, they apparently bonded, even though they had some interesting differences. And uh, so it was, uh, they, were, they were very, uh, they were good friends. John remained apparently in Jerusalem among the leadership. He apparently was not there, however, at the time of Paul's last visit. And uh, his subsequent history is unrecorded. He appears to have retired in Ephesus, but at what time is a little unclear. And these three epistles are generally presumed to have been written from Ephesus. I personally don't share that view, don't have any evidence of it, but I think he was writing to Mary who was at Ephesus. He was away from Ephesus when he wrote John too. But that's really not material. He suffered under persecution and was banished to Patmos, as we all know, which led to the book of Revelation. And then he returned to Ephesus later where he died. And there are those that believe he, re- he wrote his gospel at Ephesus after Patmos. That comes as a surprise to many. And uh, there is some, some justification for that view. But in any case, this is probably about eighty ninety eight, 98, having outlived nearly all his friends and companions, uh, and, and, and even more of his mature years. And there's some extra biblical evidence that he may have written his gospel after Patmos. So uh, my friend Hal Lindsay has taken that view, and, and uh, I don't know the full basis of it, but that, is, that apparently is a view he's being drawn to. Well, there are many interesting traditions regarding John's residence at Ephesus, but you, you, these can't claim the character of uh, historical truth. There are stories about his, the unsuccessful attempts to boil him in oil, and there's all these crazy stories that in the early church that don't have any, uh, there's no, uh, they have no historical basis that we know of. Now, John wrote five books in the New Testament. The, uh, the Gospel, the Book of Revelation, of course, and these three epistles that we're studying. And most uh, scholars assume that the epistle is written last, just before the close of the first century. I don't hold that view, but that's not material. And uh, the distincti- distinctives of his Gospel is that his purpose is clearly declared. It's not an unbiased uh, historian's account. It's an editorial piece. He wrote these to that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. He has a he has an agenda in his writings. And he does this also in his epistles seven times, by the way. And uh, the heptatic structure, the sevenfold structure, which is characteristic of the book of Revelation, is also very evident throughout his other writings. That may come as a surprise. It's obvious in Revelation. There's sevens and sevens and sevens of sevens. But uh, uh, in the gospel, it's hidden, but it's there. And in the epistles, you'll see it as we go through it here. In the book of Revelation, of course, its heptatic structure is very obvious, and we won't take time to get into that here. There's some interesting designations that, I get, that haunt me. I have to point. The term friend is the term used of Abraham. He was a friend of God. And it occurs in Genesis 18. Shall I hide from him the thing which I am to do? The concept of friendship is related by God himself to the letting him in on what's coming. That's part of friendship here. The disciples. Jesus said to his disciples, Now you're my friends. And that leads to chapters 14 and 15 of the uh, upper room discourse. They're, his, they're no longer his servants, his friends, and he then deigns to tell them what's coming. So that linkage is there. The word beloved is the same thing exaggerated. Daniel is called the beloved prophet of the Old Testament. And of course, Daniel has the apocalyptic visions that characterize the last six chapters of the 12th chapter book of Daniel. John is called the beloved disciple. We all know that, but it has occurred to you that he too is the one that authored the apocalypse of the New Testament. So there's a, I think there's an interesting, interesting linkage there that is fruitful. But the writings of John, the Gospel of John, of course, has its distinctives. The book of Revelation has its septatic structure. The epistles of John, third, second, and first. We have studied the first two, Gaius and the elect lady. Uh, but uh, we did that partly to set the stage for First John, as it's called, which is written not to a specific church, but to the church at large. And so it's really more of a sermon than a letter in that sense. Now, the general background, uh, ins- uh, he had insider status we've talked about, um, th- and I think this is uh, the consignment of Mary at the cross. We mentioned that before, the final week, the later years. Okay. And Ephesus, of course, is the scene of his final retirement. But in John's writings, let's understand when he wrote his gospel, he said, he explained why he wrote it. He says, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So this is not an unbiased account. It's a deliberate attempt to, to uh, present um, the, uh, Jesus to be, uh, uh, for the purpose of belief. 
Now, looking back at the four Gospels, Matthew, of course, gave us the promised one. We see his credentials in Matthew. Mark is going to talk about how he worked, his power. And Luke is what he was like, his nature. And John, who he actually was, his godship. And my main quarrel with Mel Gibson's movie, The, the, the Passion, is not with some of the details people quibble over, not at all. I think it's a phenomenal piece of work. But it has two defects. It presents the cross as a tragedy. No, it was an achievement planned before the foundation of the world. But the real thing, it didn't communicate who Jesus is. His Godship. And that's the critical thing that John deals with in his gospel, of course, but and in the book of Revelation as a climax. But even in these letters, we're going to see that come through. And I think it's useful for us to have in perspective the four gospels. Matthew presents Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah. Mark, the suffering servant. Luke, the son of man. He's a doctor. And John, the son of God. And uh, the genealogies in those support the main theme. Matthew uh, takes the legal one, as a Jew would, from Abraham. Mark does not have a genealogy. Luke has a genealogy. It starts with the first man, with Adam, all the way through to the through Mary. And then John... Uh, deals with the, uh, the genealogy of the pre-existent one in the first three verses. We'll be looking at that a little bit here. Matthew focuses on what Jesus actually said. Mark, what he actually did. Luke gives us a glimpse of how he felt. And John, who he was. And uh, so uh, Matthew wrote to the Jew. Mark and Luke wrote to the Roman and the Greek, respectively. But a Gentile both in that sense. But uh, John, of course, to the church, if you will. The first miracle supports that theme. The first miracle... In, to a Jew would be the leper cleanse. That's a very Jewish perception there. Because to the Jew, leper, leprosy was a type of sin. Mark and Luke to the Gentiles, demon expelled. John has a strange one, the water to wine. It's the mystical one, which of course relates to the church or the Last Supper that goes and so forth. Matthew ends with the resurrection, Mark with the ascension. Luke ends with the promise of the Holy Spirit, setting the stage for his sequel called Luke Volume 2, or commonly called the Book of Acts. And John ha ends with the promise of the return, setting the stage, if you will, for the book of Revelation. And so each, the last two d deal with their sequels. And when you camp these four signs, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, we notice that they seem to comply with those four Gospels. That's been recognized even by the early church in many ways. The lion being the lion of the tribe of Judah, the ox being the symbolic beast of burden, the man, be, of course, being the man, and, and the eagle uh, to, to John. And their styles are different with grouping, snapshots, and, and a narrative, and the mystical John. So, but in a couple of key verses from the Gospel, and then we'll get into his letter. I, I, a key verse that I don't want to uh, forget to highlight. In John chapter 1, his Gospel, he says, he, speaking of Christ, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now the word sons of God in the Hebrew, Benaiah Elohim, is a direct creation of God. It's a term used of angels in the Old Testament. And, uh, but here, see, we're, uh, people are not sons of God. They're sons of Adam. But he came, as many as received Christ, to them gave he the power to become a direct creation of God, namely the sons of God. That's why we call it a new birth. And that's, w and, and that's why you are, if you're in Christ, you are a new creature, new creation. Even to them that believe on his name. Praise God for that. Key verse. The power to become the sons of God. As many as believed on him, and when you go through his gospel, Peter, Nathaniel, Nicodemus, Sychar, woman, the man born blind, Mary and Martha, Bethany, 11 apostles, Mary Magdalene, Peter. They, there's a whole sequence there. There's a great confrontation in the gospel of John. I just tried to, before we get into this, hit some of the highlights of John so you have a, a glimpse of the man. But uh, in John chapter 8, there's a confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees. And uh, they, they, they said, we were not born of fornication. They're calling him an illegitimate bastard. So don't let the polite King James hide the fact there's a tension going on here. Well, before they're through, Jesus explains their fatherhood to them. You're going to call me illegitimate? He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And then said that Jesus said, if thou art not yet 50 years old, hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, verily, verily, I say unto you, you know, when Jesus wanted to emphasize something, he says, I say unto you such and such. When he want to underline it twice, he say, verily I say unto you. 
When he really wanted to underline, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, to you and I in English and as Gentiles, we don't, get, we don't grab that. What does that mean? No, he's declaring that he was the voice of the burning bush in Exodus 4. You and I missed the point. They didn't. Whenever you and I as Gentile readers run the risk of missing a point, the Pharisees come to our rescue. Because every time they get upset, they underline it in a way that we can relate to. See the next verse, then they took up stones to cast at him. Why? Because he claimed to be the voice of the burning bush. He claimed to be God. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And they, 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 they took stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. That explains exactly what happened. I have no idea how he got out of there. But he slipped through, right? Okay. Knowing how angry they were, that was a non-trivial thing, but there it is. I am that I am, is what God said in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And Jesus is going to make seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life, in chapter 6. I am the light of the world, in chapter 8. I am the door of the sheep, in chapter 10. I am the good shepherd, in chapter 10. I am the resurrection and the life, in verse, chapter 11. I am the way, the truth, and life, of course, in chapter 14. We've all memorized that verse. And I am the true vine, chapter 15. Seven, there are seven miracles, seven discourses, seven I am statements that make up the structure of the Gospel of John. You miss that reading it because it goes so f smoothly. You don't, you're not sensitive to its architecture. But the heptatic structure is, is there, nevertheless. He's the pre-existent one. How does the Gospel open up? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Well, this means he was God. No, he was also beside himself. If I can be a little flippant here. No, there's, that's the, the trilogy is evident there. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. But his title, all through John, is the Word of God. That is a title that John uses again and again and again. So be sensitive to that. And the incarnation, a few verses later, it says the Word was made flesh and, and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And there again we have the Word became flesh. That's the thing that is missing in, John, in Mel Gibson's uh, provocative movie, The Passion. Who he really was. He was God himself that entered his creation. And we, we get to the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, we see John writing, I saw heaven and open, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And a couple of verses later he says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And that blood is not his blood. That's the blood of his enemies. Where does that take place? In Isaiah 63. It lays it out for you. But anyway, his name is called the Word of God. Title of Christ. It's interesting that the, we know in science today that the vanguard of science, in every field of science, the boundary area is the information sciences. In biology, it's not biology anymore. It's coding theory. It's information theory. In physics, it's particle physics. It's uh, in every field of science, the boundary that we encounter is the information sciences. It's the ultimate science in a sense. And it's interesting how the word, the logos, is the title of Christ. How interesting. There's a fundamental that we're dealing with there in both cases. So, uh, second epistle of John that we just finished, the elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth and so forth. Who is the elect lady? Most people don't recognize it, but I believe for reasons that I'll show you that that is Mary. And uh, so it, that changes the entire sense of the whole letter. Who is the elect lady? She's the elect lady who all they that have no, I, uh, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but all they that have known the truth love her. So that's not just a prominent per person in the in the uh, congregation of Ephesus. She's a you, she she's the most uh, most elect of all women, and uh, no, you know, Jesus consigned her to. Uh, John the Apostle, not his, his blood brothers and, children, and sisters, whom I love in the truth also that have known the truth, which we had from the beginning. And by the way, she also had a sister, which is referenced in the letter. But another verse that uh, I'll highlight to you is in Luke, the Annunciation. When the angel came to Mary uh, and came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. I submit to you that that alone, 
identifies who the elect lady is that John is writing to, for what it's worth. There's no other woman more singularly elected than Mary, if you will. And not only that, she was specifically consigned to John's care, so it's natural that he would write her an intimate, private, personal letter of encouragement and also exhortation. So uh, we could go through her. We did that last time. I'll leave that. We'll just go ahead here. And so the second epistle of John, practical, walk in love, the divine insistence upon love, the human expression of love is all in there. The doubt to watch against error, warning against false teaching, warning against false charity, and parting comments is the letter, and that's from last time. The third epistle we took earlier uh, talks about, about, about three uh, people. Gaius, was, uh, he was one of the good guys, did well. Diotrophes was uh, uh, the loser. He's the problem guy, evil by pride and strife. Demetrius is commended, so that's just some personal letters that uh, John includes. Now we're into what we want, where we're going to start the big trek here, First John. John's gospel speaks of our past. It has to do with salvation. Our salvation is a done deal. It was done on a wooden cross 2,000 years ago. John's letters deal with our present. It has to do with sanctification. John's letters presume you're saved. It deals with how you should be walking. And John's revelation is our future, the glorious appearing. So you, if you think of John's gospel letters and revelation as past, present, future focus, Maybe that's helpful. But uh, 1 John has been called the sanctum centaurum of the New Testament. It takes the child of God into the fellowship of the Father's home. We're going to experience in this letter a focus on fellowship that is unequaled anywhere else in the New Testament. Paul's epistles and all the other epistles are church epistles. But this is a family epistle. And it may prove more important to the individual believer than all the church epistles. Paul's letters were primarily to the churches. Yes, there's individual instructions, of course, but uh, they're addressed to, they're, they're the church epistles. This one is family. And life is real. And it's a battleground, not a playground. And that's what John is going to be dealing with. This is one of the sons of thunder writing you his letter. This isn't some namby-pamby preacher. This is the son of thunder, if you will. And if a person is wrong about Jesus Christ, he's wrong about God. And if he's wrong about God, he's wrong about everything else. That's, that's basically John's logic in this letter. Now, there's seven contrasts of truth and error in this letter. Now, I want you to start noticing the sevens. The light versus the darkness. The Father versus the world. Christ versus the Antichrist in chapter 2. Good works versus evil works in chapter 2. The, the, e the Holy Spirit versus error in chapter 4. Love versus pious pretense in chapter 4. The God-born versus all the others in chapter 5. But again, it's sevenfold contrasts we're going to discover as we proce proceed through this uh, letter. There are going to be seven tests we're going to look at. The tests of our profession in chapter 1 and 2. Tests of our desire in chapter 2. Tests of doctrine will be called for in chapter 2. Tests of conduct in chapter 2 and 3. Tests of discernment in chapter 4. Tests of motive in chapter 4. And of new birth in chapter 5. This is not a, uh, a, 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 this is not a uh, introductory course for new believers just getting started. This is heavy stuff. This is serious stuff. So be ready to go deeply into John's uh, 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 narrative here. The heptatic structure, we have seven traits of the born again. We have seven reasons why this epistle is written. We have seven tests of the Christian's genuineness, seven tests of honesty and reality. We're going to also encounter six liars, not seven, six. And because uh, lion, lion isn't finished, there's still more lion coming, right? Anyway, so, so those are just to give you a feeling. Be sensitive. Don't make a big thing of it. Be sensitive to the fact that there is architecture here. The Holy Spirit's got his fingerprints all over this thing. The six liars. We say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice truth, he tells us in this first chapter. If we say that we have not sinned and we make him a liar and his truth is not in us. Second time we get the liar there. Third one, he saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. Ouch. Some of these hurt, don't they? But it continues. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist and denieth the Father and the Son. If, I, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? 
ouch, these things are, uh, these aren't comfortable questions. He that believeth on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. He that believeth not, God hath made God a liar. Because he hath believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So that's John's logic. There it is, six of them. Spiritual fundamentals. We're going to see all inclusive commandments. That we believe on Jesus Christ and that we love one another. That's going to be hammered home in many, many ways. A profession of love for others. The father sacrificing his son. That's love's last word. And perfect love casteth out fear in chapter 4. Okay. Thought we'd never get there, didn't you? We're actually at verse 1 of 1 John. And we're, going to, we're seeing the first here of three beginnings. There's a beginning in Genesis 1, and there's a beginning in the Gospel of John 1. Here in the Epistle of John, again, he begins at the beginning. That's pretty logical. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, from which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life. Notice there's no greeting here. This isn't addressed to a particular church. It isn't addressed to a particular friend. It really becomes somewhat of a sermon in general. There's no greeting here. This is for all God's people everywhere, in effect. And John opens with a strong declaration of the reality of Christ, which he has heard, seen, gazed upon, and handled. That's very palpable. That's very tangible. Heard, he says. Heard is in the present tense. It began in the past, but it still continues. The word heard here is continuing. It's not once and for all. It's continuing. Are we together? Okay. Okay. The word seen with physical eyes and uh, the uh, uh, gazed upon and, and uh, contemplated, viewed attentively, intensely studied, contemplated, it, it, it really focused on, in other words. It's the word from which we get the word theater, by the way. In other words, commanding your attention. And uh, it's the same word that Israel gazed when it gazed upon the brazen serpent, Numbers 21, that we talked about before. And handled. We've actually, he actually handled him. Now that may not be important to you, but from your background from the previous sessions about Gnosticism, you understand that's important. The Gnostics said that some of them felt that he wasn't tangible. He was a, a spirit of some kind. He didn't leave footprints when he walked. And we always have, there'd be probably a question on the final exam. Is there occasion when Christ didn't leave footprints? Absolutely, when he walked on water, right? Okay. Don't let me throw you that on the final. The deity of Christ. All this is a firm rebuttal to the myths of the Gnostics. That's why I put the, we went through all that in previous sessions. The Gnostics in various styles denied the tangible existence of Christ. Only John uses the title, the Word. Here, the Word of Life. Jesus is the noun of God. Jesus is the verb of God. Jesus is the adjective of God. He, he grammatically can fit all three of those, believe it or not. When you look at Jesus, you see the love of God and the holiness of God. That's a big, big statement. Let that sink in. There were three beginnings. Genesis, we just seen one of them just then in 1 John. Another one is in the beginning God created heaven and the earth. And uh, Nachmanides and Maimonides, uh, uh, b b b uh, these are writers back in the 12th, 13th century determined that matter, energy, and time and space all had a beginning. Well, the great discovery of 20th century science is the acknowledgement that the universe did indeed have a beginning. That's what leads to the Big Bang's conjectures and all of that. Well, that's exactly what the Bible said in the, uh, for all along. It opens the, it opened, it says that three times. In the beginning of the Torah, in the beginning of the Gospel of John, and the beginning of 1 John. Back in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things are made by Him, without Him was not any made that was made. So Jesus Christ is co-existent, co-eternal, and co-equal with God. It's basically what He's saying. The pre-existent Christ, that which was already from the beginning. I love the definition of truth. That's when the Word and the deed become one. Christ was predicted all through the Old Testament when He makes His appearance the word and the deed become one. And so that, and that's the sense in which he is both the noun, the verb, and the adjective of God all at one time. So I'd get down to the second verse. Didn't think we'd make it, did you? But we're making progress here. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Manifested. See, Christ is also historically manifested. That is, 
to appear, make made visible. The Christ of reality is also real experientially. Real Christianity is a personal experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just a belief system and not a set of ideas you give intellectual assent with. No, it's a personal experience with our coming King. There's a deadly difference between church membership and salvation. A deadly difference between those two. Knowing about Jesus and knowing Him are not the same thing. And that, that is going to lurk through our entire study of 1 John. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That leads to one of the most important words in the New Testament. The word for fellowship with Him. We encounter one of the greatest words in the Bible, koinonia. That's why we call the, our, our institute the Koinonia Institute. That's why our publisher is Koinonia House. Koinonia, fellowship, close mutual relationship, participation, partnership, communion. It's also the Greek word for fiduciary, putting someone else's interests ahead of your own. Sharing something together. Fellowship, key word. It's two-dimensional, by the way. It's horizontal, that's fellowship with one another. And it's vertical, fellowship with God the Father. Both are indispensable. There are two families in this world. Jesus said, ye are of your father, the devil. He said that to the guys in John 8. They called him illegitimate. <laughs> and he explained to their parentage, back to them. So you can't join the family of God. You've got to be born into it. It's a new creation event that takes place. And uh, nowhere in the Bible does God heal a, 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 a heart. He gives you a new one. The heart is desperately, the word is incurably wicked. The heart is incurably wicked. So God gives you a new one. It's a new birth. You are a new creature. Those, those aren't just idiomatic conveniences. They're very, very fundamental theology. When you're born in the family of God, you become part of the greatest fellowship in the world. And of course, that's dealt with all through the New Testament epistles. But the astonishing aspect of our fellowship is vertical. That's with God himself. He talks to you through his word. You should be carrying on a conversation with him. You speak to him in prayer, he'll speak to you in your daily reading. And the dynamics of that are something you have to experience personally. Hearing it preached to you doesn't cut it. You've got to experience it. You need to adopt a, a systematic daily reading program. Doesn't matter which one, but have one. A systematic daily reading program. And you need to pray intensely daily. And when those things start to couple, then you begin to realize what's going on. Because he'll actually talk to you through your daily readings. And as you get sensitive to that, you'll be astonished at how relevant those readings will be to the issues that you'll be facing each day. He talks to you through his word. You talk to him, of course, through prayer. And uh, that's not a question of giving him your to-do lists. The question of having a fellowship with him, sharing with him your heart. And uh, most of what you need, he knows about it long before you ask. Now, is your communication with God half duplex or full duplex? Half duplex is... I talk and then you, like if you're on the radio and you say over, it's the other guy's turn. He talks to you, that's half duplex. On a telephone, you're full duplex. You can interrupt each other, can't you? See, that's the difference. Well, is your communication with God half duplex or full duplex? I'll let you think about that. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that we also have fellowship with, uh, uh, have fellowship with us, John speaking, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. With us. See, there's a caveat here. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Friendship, yes. Fellowship, no. Yes, you can be friends with unbelievers, of course. But you don't have fellowship with them. That's a different kind of thing. To marry someone who's lost is to commit a lifetime of grief. I won't ask for a show of hands. Okay. Verse 4, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Simple little verse. John wants your joy to be full, not half full. That your joy may be full. Is your joy full? If it's not, something you shouldn't deal with. 
This is one of the seven reasons why this epistle was written. Remember we had seven of those we listed earlier. Do you have joy today? Most people have just enough religion to make them miserable. That's not what we're talking about here. Let's get be clear on that. Joy. The most joyous truth in our hearts is to know that Jesus Christ is our personal Savior. Our personal Savior. That our home is in heaven and that we have a special reason for living. One of the reasons many Christians have so little joy is that they don't study their Bible. If, you're not, if, you're, if, if your life isn't full of joy, it won't surprise me if you also end up admitting that you're not in the Word every day. Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found and I did eat them, digested them. Jeremiah 15, 16. Can start your pilgrimage to joy. One of the greatest tragedies in our culture is that our youth have been denied the reality by the theories and conjectures that they're bombarded with in their schools and entertainments and so forth. They don't have that reality, that background. Jeremiah says, Thy words were found and I did eat them. He digested them. It's interesting in the Jewish culture, the clean animals are the ones that have, they chew their cud. You don't hear it just once and swallow it. You ever watch your dog eat a piece of leftover steak? It's gone. I always turn to him, did you chew that real well? He looks at me innocently. No. No, see, the, 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 the cud chewing animals are the clean animals. Um, thy words were found and I did eat them. I digested them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. What a privilege. What a privilege. The more you digest, the more you understand. The more you understand, the more you can digest. There's a growth thing going on. In our institute, we have bronze, silver, and gold medallion levels. And the, amount, the kinds of materials we can provide at the higher levels, are we're able to do that because by then you've grown to... That's, that's exactly what Paul does in the Epistle to Hebrews. He, he scolds them for staying on milk and not the more substantive foods, the stronger foods. The stereotrophus and so on. See, the Bible is the ultimate gourmet meal. You will never exhaust the Bible. The more you study it, the more you'll discover. And the more you discover, the more you... It, it, it's an it's a, a iter, iter thing. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. The Hebrew actually is, thy name is called upon me. What it really says. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Some manuscripts here translate our joy rather than your joy. Doesn't matter. It works both ways. Okay? Either way, it's a wonderful truth. Your joy, our joy. Soul winning also is a fulfilling joy. What joy you have when somebody else's destiny and eternity is changed because of your witness to them. Wow. What a thrill that is. As you really, as you really understand what's going on there. My wife and I are getting letters from all over the world with our book, The Kingdom, Power, and the Glory. And it's staggering to find the kinds of letters where people describe that their lives are fundamentally changing because of that book, because of what it draws them into. Praise God. Ye are our joy and glory, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Wow, God is light. That's the, you know, that was the first quote of God in the, in the Bible, isn't it? Let light be, is what it actually says. But that's also the basis of our fellowship. We need to understand His terms for fellowship. We're going to later discover that, uh, that God is also love. That's the basis of our sonship. God is light. The Lord is my light and my salvation, the psalmist tells us. God dwells in unapproachable light. Wow. 1 Timothy 6, and all through the Torah, of course. Let light be, is God's first quote in the Torah. The Shekinah, the Holy Spirit, glory, was a cloud of light at night, smoke by day. Light also represents knowledge. And the information sciences we have recently discovered there are fundamental, uh, there are the fundamental behind everything, from particle physics and the DNA to the cosmos itself, that it, the information sciences. Light is still the fundamental paradox in physics. Is it a light? Is it a particle? 
It's only a particle when you're looking at it. Really? Yeah. Anyway, verse 3 of Hebrews, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Wow. How interesting. It's exactly what Scientific American quoted in the June uh, 2005 issue. An article says if, if the constants of science are changing, and they apparently are, then that implies that our reality is but a shadow of a larger reality. Well, that's what the Bible's been saying all along. They were not made of things which do appear. And the very particles, sub subatomic particles of which things are made are smaller than the wavelengths of light themselves. And Psalm 19 deals with that on the cosmic. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork, and so on. So, morally, light represents His holiness. Why? Because light reveals. Light reveals. There is no darkness in God. You know, in the Greek, it's a double negative. But in English, a double negative is a bad, bad grammar. In Greek, a double negative is a way of emphasis. The grammar is a, a different construction there. There is not no darkness in God, is what the Greek says. And in the Greek, that's emphatic. It's a double, it's an, an emphasizing. And James says a similar thing. He says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variables, neither shadow of turning. And the word variableness is in the Greek is the word from which we get parallax. When, thing, when, th when light is collinear like in a laser, it implies that the source is at infinity. And so you can take all the properties of light and see them line up with various attributes of God, strangely enough. But I decided I'd get into that too often anyway. I decided not to detour this. But the variableness is a, is a, a, a parallax or a, a parallel rays from light, which is mathematically at infinity. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth not. That's in the Gospel, of course. And also in the Gospel, a quote from the Gospel, And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And the word there is agapeo. Men love darkness. I thought, well, anyway. Man, moreover, is unholy. That's the problem. God is holy, man is not. And that is the primary problem all the way through. Secret, now I love what Lewis Sperry Schaefer said. Secret sin down here is open scandal in heaven. It's very disturbing to begin to realize in our life that when we sin, that's a public display as far as heaven's concerned. That's disturbing. John 8 then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. See, our concept of God will ultimately determine the kind of life we live. If we have a low concept of God, then we will live a low life. Are we surprised as we watch the politicians endure one scandal after another? They're a byproduct of their concept of God, their worldview won't cut it. If we have a high concept of God, we will be challenged to live a high and noble life. They go together. Look at the kind of leadership of our founding fathers of this country and contrast it with our more recent leadership. Is there a contrast between our founding fathers in terms of their concept of God and the leadership that contaminates our hallways of power today? The unspoken criticisms. Why is it that most Christians are not alert, well-informed, stable, dependable, alive, and so forth? Have you, people don't often talk that way outside, but is that an unspoken criticism? Too, it's too prevalent. Why are so many untrustworthy, critical, harsh, repelling, and negative? If God is light, then He can do all this. Why does it seem to happen to only a few? That's disturbing. The world is tired of hearing extraordinary claims from ordinary lives. John says, verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. This is the first of three professions that are betrayed by our actions. If we say we have fellowship in verse 6, if we say that we have no sin in verse 8, if we say we have not sinned in verse 10, these are lies. We're living lies. We walk in darkness. What does it mean to walk in darkness? That's your essay question. Take a pad and 
you know, give me three paragraphs on what does it mean to walk in darkness? No, I won't. I don't want enough time. I don't have time to read them. It means to walk in sin and disobedience. It means to practice things that are contrary to holiness and the light of God. It's that simple. Relationship puts us into the family of God. Fellowship is experienced in Christ. It permits us the life of the family to shine out through us. God is holy. He cannot and will not tolerate sin. If you are living in sin, God will not have fellowship with you. Habakkuk says in the Old Testament, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. That's an attribute of God. A condition of our fellowship is that it must stand in the light of Him. His ways, His terms. When you say you are in fellowship with God, you are saying, I have stepped out of darkness and into the light. That's what Paul deals with in Colossians 1. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. John is attacking a heresy that was rampant in his day. It's also rampant in our own day. People are saying that it was possible to be in fellowship with God and to be in sin at the same time. Amos, back in chapter 3, verse 3, famous verse, Can two walk together except they be agreed? It's interesting that when Abraham offered Isaac, when they walked up that hill, the, the, the actual Hebrew says, they both of them went together in agreement. Isaac was probably about 30 at the time. He wasn't the little 12-year-old boy you see pictured in the comic books. And he went knowingly. He went knowingly, strangely enough, in Genesis 22. John is saying that if we claim that we are walking in fellowship while walking in darkness, we're living a lie. Among other things, we misrepresent our Lord. And we also misdirect the lost. Wow. What responsibilities we have when we cause others to stumble. Darkness. Most of us assume that darkness is simply the absence of light. That's not quite an accurate picture. Because in Genesis, the fourth verse of Genesis chapter 1, God divided the light from the darkness. The chosek, the, the very different kind of darkness he's dealing with there. Not just the absence of light. Something more sinister. There are such, th such things as black holes. Dense concentrations from which no light can escape. So light and darkness. Darkness is not simply the absence of light. It's not that simple. Even in physics. Darkness attracts darkness. And wallowing in it is long enough can make escape virtually impossible. Fortunately, the word virtually is there. So how do you turn off the light? If you're walking light, how do you turn it off? How do you go about it? Suppose you go out and, well, you do it by skipping church. Not meeting, not, you know, neglecting to meet together. That's one way to start. By stopping your daily scriptural reading. If you're not reading a Bible every day, you're going to die of malnourishment. No, I shouldn't say die. You should suffer from national worth. Failing to spend time with Him. We learn of Him through the Word. We gain our relationship with Him in our devotional life. You learn through the Word. You grow in a relationship with Him in your devotional life. That should be part of your spiritual nutrition. Part of your spiritual hygiene. Failing to take frequent personal bear, uh, spiritual bearings. From time to time, take bearings on your life. How are you doing? You're going to be com uh, 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 confronted with a report card before the beam of seat. Why don't you take a glimpse and make a guess of where it stands now and see what you can do to improve it. Failing to correct the d dead reckoning with periodic reliable bearings. You know, in navigation, you dead reckon. Take a certain speed, a certain course. But from time to time, you've got to get a confirming fix because you could be drifting and not know it. You need to correct your dead reckoning with periodic reliable bearings to account for drift. How do you turn off the light? Well, denial also works. Pretending everything's okay, that's presumptuous and self-deceiving, of course. I don't recommend it. John says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If I'm going to walk in the light, it means to hide nothing. If I'm going to walk with God, I'm going to have to know his likes and dislikes. It's his call. I don't make the rules. He does. 
My challenge is to understand his buying habits. Like any good servant, you want to know his preferences and his buying habits. You know, I'm always intrigued. You're in a large organization, big or you're part of a big company or big organization, and the top boss changes. He either dies or gets promoted or leaves the company. There's now a new boss in charge. Everybody in the organization scrambles around to find out what's he like, what's he favor, and they, they work hard to find out what his preferences are. You know, and uh, uh, well, we should be doing the same thing with our boss. We should be finding out what he likes and dislikes. There's another thing, by the way, that you learn if you've been in a large organization. Watch the boss's secretary. When he calls into the office, do you ever see her go in there without her pad? Never, never, never. She called, come on in. She'll grab her pad and pencil. She didn't go in there unarmed because she knows she's going to get some assignments and she's going to jot it down. Right? When you have your appointment with the Lord in prayer, do you have a pad alongside to jot down the assignments he's going to give you? Why not? Do you take them seriously or not? First Peter, in his letter, says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people. Well, I think we agree with the peculiar people part of it. And that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's the same idioms here. In Ephesians, Paul says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, and so on. See, there is a difference between profession and practice. We need to walk the talk. That's what John is focusing on. The cleansing blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That's all through the Old Testament. That was the huge problem of Judaism after the temple fell in 70 AD. They had no place to shed blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There's no temple. There's no shedding. They had to redefine Judaism in the Council of Yamnia. And that's what led to the Talmudic Judaism we see today. Relatively little uh, con compliance to Mosaic Judaism of the Bible. Now, by the way, this was taught very, very early in the book of Genesis. God took away their skins of uh, fig leaves and gave them coats of skins of animals. Why? Because they're more durable? No, 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 no. He's teaching them by the shedding of innocent blood, they would be covered. By the shedding of innocent blood. There's, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. See, the blood is peace-giving, Paul tells us in Colossians 1. It's conscience purging, Paul tells us in Hebrew 9. It's prevailing. It's cleansing. And, and it's, we're going to go into that here shortly here. How it goes, it goes on cleansing. So... So in addition to the once and for all redemptive act for all time and eternity at the cross, there's a, blood is, uh, is cleansing. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Wow, that's pretty exciting. That's great stuff. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. See, it's essential to note the difference between sin singular and sins plural. Here in verse 8, it is singular. The genetic defect that is the root of our problem. Sin that is in man, uh, is that it, sin is that in man which makes him want to play God on every occasion. We want the world to revolve around us. It is our innate self-centeredness, sometimes called pride, selfishness, self-will, what have you. In verse 9, it's going to follow here. It will be in the plural, the specific fruits of this root problem. He that covereth his sins, in Proverbs 28, 13, shall not prosper. Therein it's plural. Let's not quibble about what is a sin. God has made it clear. Our reinterpretation is notwithstanding. So what should we do with them? And the next verse is your memory verse for the chapter. You're going to get introduced to the Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1.9. Precious, precious verse. I use it daily. I have to use it daily. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from most of our unrighteousness. No, oh, 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 yes. All are, you know, that's a precious verse for a lot of reasons. If we confess, we've got to claim ownership. No excuses. No excuses. 
The word is confess. Homologeo. To say the same, it means to say the same thing. We need to say it the way he would say it. We are to say the same thing that God says. In other words, we need to take his point of view. What's his point of view about subject X? That's what we mean by confession. We confess our sins. We need to acknowledge our ownership of our sin. We need to commit to forsake it. We don't only confess it. We own it and we also commit to get rid of it. To put it behind us. To shed the baggage of that commitment. But let's not be general or include conditionals like if we have and all that. Let's be specific and admit the ownership to the entire list. And it may take time. We may need to pray some time and spare because we may have a, quite a list to go through. And let's include forsaking in our prognosis and commitment. The word forsaking is an essential connector with confession. Repentance involves more than regret. It includes a commitment to turning from our sin. And here's the great part of this whole thing. It's not my faithfulness that has anything to do with this. I love this part. What a relief. See, if we confess our sins, if we own it, forsake it, great. He, it's His faithfulness that's operative here. He is faithful and just. Wow. It's His faithfulness that's the key to the whole thing. Forgiveness, that's judicial. And cleansing, that's hygienic. He's faithful just to forgive us our sins and, and, not just forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What joy, what comfort is in that phrase. Yes, you'll forgive us our sins, that's judicial. I'm glad, great. You know, that, that enters the log, you know, the, the log book properly, great. Oh, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, that's more than judicial, that's hygienic. Praise God. Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. That's your memory assignment. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. You know, it's remarkable to discover how many false cults deny the reality of the existence of sin. They say sin doesn't exist. You know, Christian science and so forth. Christian science, Unity School of Christianity, the religious science, all these groups Deny the existence of sin. It's also the prominent, prominent feature of non-Christian religions such as Theosophy, Hinduism, and Buddhism. They all teach that sin does not really exist. Even the field of psychology. They acknowledge that guilt is the core of most mental illness and such. They can only treat the symptom, not the cause. They can try to treat the guilt. The, the, the source of that is the sin. They have no answer to the sin. That's why psychology is doomed to failure. For a lot of reasons. It attempts to infer the external behavior of an infinite state machine from its external behavior. You can't do that. The only way we can infer its internal behavior is by having a designer's manual. In a computer or in a human being. Either way. Sin is the cause. Guilt is the symptom. Sin is the cause. Guilt is but a system. Well, here is your escape hatch. We've talked about your, your, your bar of soap. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I had to tag this in here. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Praise God for that. What a, what a, a critical resource to add to your memory verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Are you making God a liar? Be careful about that one. The practical application of all this is simple and direct. Go to Him and talk with Him as you do it, as no one else. Tell Him your problems. Tell Him your sins. Be specific. <clears throat> Be specific. Tell Him your weaknesses. I said weakness, but I had to correct the slide. I think, I think it's a plural. Huh? Lay it all out on the line. Ask Him to forgive, to cleanse, strengthen, and be serious about it. Whenever we sin, we have an accuser, a prosecuting attorney, who demands the death penalty because of our sin. Ooh. Okay. Now, 1 John chapter 2 
says we have an advocate to plead our case. We're going to review that. We know we have an accuser. Let's take a look at our advocate next time. So I want you to read the epistle of 1 John. It's only five chapters. But study carefully the first 14 verses of chapter 2 for next time. So you're getting off easy. You've got half a chapter coming next time. And that's the only time I'm going to do that. Okay? So sin need not reign anymore. Sin need not reign anymore. It ain't going to rain no more. But that's R-E-I-G-N anymore. So study chapter 2. And let's stand for a closing word of prayer.